Hi, welcome back. What I want to do in this video is really get to know not just glucose, but uh, some of the other monosaccharides. And um, you, it, it, you, you don't have a complete look at glycolysis until you, you've looked at all, or at least some of the other monosaccharides, because certainly there are other monosaccharides in our diet. If you eat um, an apple or something, you get fructose. And what I want to do in the next few videos is take an individual video and look at the, the various um, the pathways for degrading or getting um, certain other monosaccharides into glycolysis. And the first one we're going to do is fructose. And I went ahead and drew the structure of fructose for you. And I, I mentioned in another video that glucokinase can bind fructose and it will still phosphorylate at the sixth position, just like glucokinase. However, this is very unlikely because the specificity of glucokinase is really just for glucose. It's very unlikely that the fructose catabolism will proceed by that pathway. And of course, if you if you did phosphorylate at the 6 position, you'd have fructose 6-phosphate and that would just enter glycolysis at fructose 6-phosphate. But we have but normally fructose will react with fructokinase. And this particular enzyme is different in the fact that it phosphorylates it phosphorylates at the one position. And so what we're going to do is we're going to invest in ATP and we're going to phosphorylate fructose at the one position. So what I'm going to get is going to look something like this. So right here, that's the sixth position. Oops. You know I have to be careful with this right now. It's scrolling all over the place. So here is fructose 1-phosphate. So let me go ahead and write that. This is fructose 1-phosphate. And fructose 1-phosphate um, is going to be consumed by another enzyme. And let me scroll over. And this enzyme is called fructose 1-phosphate aldolase. And what I want to be clear about, I want to be clear about something. This is a different aldolase than what we saw in regular glycolysis. So we saw an aldolase there, and I, I don't know if I mentioned it, but really the true name of that particular aldolase was fructose bisphosphate aldolase. This is a completely different aldolase, although the, the organic mechanism is, 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 is exactly the same. It's, it's a reverse aldol condensation. Um, and certainly if you, um, if you looked at your organic chemistry too, you, that should be familiar to you. But um, this is a different aldolase. And it's going to generate similar products. It's going to generate similar products to what we've seen. So here's the products. It's going to generate, number one, glycerone phosphate. And remember, we can also call that dihydroxyacetone phosphate. I prefer glycerone phosphate just because it rolls off the tongue a little bit better. Um, and it also generates something called, and actually, by the way, remember that this gets consumed by triose phosphate isomerase to form what? To form glyceraldehyde free phosphate, right? So this gets consumed by triose phosphate isomerase and it forms glyceraldehyde three phosphate, right? And then that, that's what's directly used by glycolysis. But another product, another product that is um, created by fructose 1-phosphate aldolase is glyceraldehyde is glyceraldehyde. And this is actually without the phosphate. This is just straight glyceraldehyde. Um, notice it doesn't have the phosphate on it. So what you're going to have to do to get it in, oops, to get it in, come on, keep hitting that. To get it in this form is you're going to have to use an enzyme called triose kinase. And it's a triose because it is three carbon sugar. And what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to invest in ATP and we're going to get out an ADP. And this is also going to form, um, it's also going to form two glyceraldehyde, three, it's going to form a glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So ultimately what we get is per fructose, we get two G3Ps. So ultimately let's regroup. 
So we start with fructose, and we, we use the enzyme fructokinase, and already there's a little bit of angle strain on the fructose ring, the furanose ring. So it's going to be relatively easy for this aldolase to bust it up. So we get fructose 1-phosphate through that kinase. Then we get fructose 1-phosphate aldolase, which generates two products, glycerone phosphate and glyceraldehyde. Di or, uh, glycerone phosphate, also dihydroxyacetone phosphate, gets consumed by triose phosphate isomerase to form glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And glyceraldehyde gets consumed by triose kinase with the consumption of an ATP to form glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And so ultimately we get two of these, and these ultimately go into glycolysis. Now, what I want to be clear about is, and actually this is an important point with fructose. I'll go back here so we can see the structure of fructose. If you remember, um, the enzyme, or at least the entry point of fructose, which we just talked about, was glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. What I want to point out is that that is after the enzyme phosphofructokinase 1. Oops. Got to be careful. That is after the enzyme phosphofructokinase 1. Right? Okay. Phosphofructokinase 1 is the main regulatory enzyme of glycolysis. So if phosphofructokinase gets shut off, or if, you know, it gets, you know, the, the activity of it goes down through allosteric regulation, pretty much everything that enters before PFK, that particular metabolism basically stops. So in other words, if I have some stimulus to shut off PFK, to slow it down, right? Glucose, for instance, which enters obviously before PFK, glucose no longer gets catabolized, right? Because if PFK gets shut off, there's nothing to, I mean, I mean, you know, if I have, if I have glucose, I mean, certainly, um, you know, gluco glucokinase could form glucose 6-phosphate, you could have phosphoglucoisomerase and get fructose 6-phosphate, but there's nowhere for fructose 6-phosphate to go because PFK is shut off. So every monosaccharide that enters before PFK um, ultimately um, can't go anywhere and can't go to pyruvate if PFK is shut off. However, the reason I mention this is because it turns out that fructose is not under that control. Fructose's entry into glycolysis is after PFK. It's the only one, only important monosaccharide that's after PFK. And so even if PFK is shut off, Glycol those en the enzymes after glycolysis can or after PFK can in glycolysis can still run, and they run by Le Chatelier's principle. If I load up the body, if I load up the cell with glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, which was over here, if I load it up with glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate by Le Chatelier's principle, it's going to force it towards pyruvate, right? But there's no control of fructose metabolism by PFK. So even if you shut off PFK, fructose will still be catabolized. And so there's several important applications of this. Number one, have you ever heard of high fructose corn syrup? And uh, this is just an experience of mine. If you drink a lot of, let's say you're sedentary and you're drinking a lot of soda that has high fructose corn syrup, you will gain weight very rapidly. And the reason you gain weight is because um, there's no regulation on fructose metabolism. So you'll keep producing pyruvate and therefore keep producing acetyl-CoA. And one thing that we haven't talked about yet is that acetyl-CoA is used in fat synthesis. And so you gain fat weight, right? You gain fat weight. And so what ends up happening is when you cut out the high fructose corn syrup, even without exercising, you drop the weight. And the reason is because you're no longer fueling that fat synthesis. You're no longer forming the pyruvate. Um, however, there is a cell that likes to use fructose as a substrate, and it's a sperm cell. And sperm cells, um, the, the semen that the sperm cells are in, contains a lot of fructose. And the reason is because sperm cells only metabolize fructose. And if you think about it, it makes sense. The fructose have a flagella. They have a flagella. And the flagella uses a lot of ATP, right? And so one thing that's important to understand is ATP, and we'll talk about this later, 
is an allosteric inhibitor of PFK. It inhibits PFK. So if I, if I was using like glucose metabolism and I build up a lot of ATP, it's going to show off PFK and my, and my you know, ATP production shuts down, right? But if I'm using fructose, I can produce all the ATP in the world, but my fructose metabolism isn't dependent on PFK, so I still can make ATP, right? Of course, you do have to worry about pyruvate kinase, but it's, it's significantly less regulation than PFK, okay? And so when with every ejaculation that the male does, um, when he ejaculates into the female, the sperm cells are migrating towards the ovum. And so the way they do that is by constantly catabolizing fructose. And the reason they use it as a fuel source is because they have to keep beating that flagella over and over and over again. And they consume a lot of ATP. And for every beat of the flagella, you're consuming ATP. So it makes sense to have a sugar that's not regulated by PFK, and that would be fructose. Um, and so that's just kind of, those are two very common applications, the high fructose corn syrup, and of course the, um, the sperm cell, and sperm cells pretty much only use fructose metabolism. And so what we see is that fructose enters at the level of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So I hope this video helped. In the next video, I think what we'll do is we'll look at um, mannose metabolism. And then after that, we'll look at galactose metabolism. And that will conclude our monosaccharide catabolisms. See you in the next video.